Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. I'm really pleased to be here with Karen Hirsch for this really interesting conversation about forgotten drinks. I don't even know the rest of the, uh, the title because I'm just like, that sounds so awesome. <laughs> um, but we, before we get started, I just wanna say thank you to the Ashland, the Friends of the Ashland Library, which su they support all of our programming. So any donations you make to the Ash Friends of the Ashland Library comes straight to something like this. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Native, uh, Ashland Historical Society who we've partnered with where, for this program and they've always been super supportive of the library. So we appreciate them. Okay, so Corin Hirsch is an award-winning journalist and dining critic and author of Forgotten Drinks of Colonial New England from Flips and Rattleskulls to Switchel and Bruce Spear. So she's gonna be talking about all kinds of drinks, but I was interested in her bio about that you're a self-professed endurance eater. What does that mean? And how does that relate to this conversation? Oh, uh, yeah, that's well from my job, my current job, which is I am a food writer on staff at Newsday, which is the daily newspaper on Long Island. We have three food writers because there's so many restaurants and places to eat on Long Island. Um, sometimes when I go out to report, I'll eat five or six places in a row, um, you know, and it does take a certain amount of endurance. So over time, I just started saying I'm an endurance eater. So. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So. I just wanted to remind everybody who's here that you can put questions in the chat and you can also raise your hand and I can unmute you later as we get into the program. But Corinne, it's all you. I'm gonna turn my video off and I'm gonna just listen. Well, thank you, Nina. And thank you all for coming here. Um, I can't see anyone's faces, but I know you're there. Um, I, I appreciate you coming to this presentation. And I wonder, I have spoken in that area before. I don't know if any of you have um, seen this before. It kind of changes over time. I wrote this book, Forgotten Drinks of Colonial New England, several years ago now, um, not expecting that it would generate uh, a lot of interest, not really even having any concept of speaking or doing presentations. I just wrote this book when this particular press the history press at the time, it's now called, um, I forget what they've changed their name to, but they reached out to see if I wanted to write a book on food in Vermont. I was living in Vermont at the time, and I was a food writer on staff at a paper in Burlington, and um, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, I have some visuals to show you while I talk, and I have the chat window open, so if you have questions as I talk, Please, you can put them in the chat window, but I'll, I'll stop at the end of showing these visuals to have a QA and a if you have some other questions that we can just have a conversation afterward or during. Just feel free to shoot questions to me. I'll, I'll monitor, I'll dual monitor different windows. Um, and I'm going to bring up the presentation right now, so it will be a little bit awkward for a minute um, as I share the screen. Down here. And there we go. So hopefully you can all see uh, the words drink lights like it's 1699. I'm trying to expand that a little bit further. That's actually a, um, a skeleton from a pirate flag from the early 1700s. I, I think it's Bartholomew, Bartholomew Roberts. So now I'm gonna do full screen mode. And I don't think you can see that. Can you see full screen? No, I think no, this is okay. where you- uh, I'll do the new share. Okay. Yeah. Um, how does that look? That's better. Great. So, uh, oh, moving forward. So I would, what, as I mentioned, I was working as a food writer when I wrote this book, I was working in Vermont. And this is just to set the scene slightly, these two. On the right is a picture of a cider maker, Citizen Cider. You might've seen their products in the store. That was when they were just starting out in Burlington. And on the left is a, uh, a beer from a small artisanal brewery in Vermont. And Vermont at the time was going through a renaissance in uh, sort of distilleries and breweries that were springing up all over the place. And they still are, but 
it was really in the heyday of, of every week we bring new news or a new cidery or uh, distillery. And that, that's the point at which this press reached out to see if I wanted to write a book about food in Vermont. But I also covered the alcohol scene. That's always been an interest of mine. So I suggested doing something on uh, looking at the historical roots of, of drinking in New England. And that's how the book came about. So uh, I had had an interest. Oh, my dock is showing. Up. Do you guys see my dock at the bottom? No? Okay. Yeah, we do see the. Um... Okay. Well, you know, it's not that big a deal. Uh, I'm going to try to get rid of it while I talk. But if I don't, it's going to stay there. I wanted to hide it before. Um, I. Yeah, but it's interfering with the type here. Hang on one second. Um, so this is uh, what's showing on my screen right now, and I might have gone back to seeing all of this stuff around this, is a print from William Hogarth from uh, 1751, an engraving called Beer Street. And uh, it shows the, um, actually here's Jim Lane. Jim Lane is the first one I wanted to mention. I used to stare at this when I was a kid. It was in a book on, a book on piracy uh, and why people went into piracy and showing kind of the miserable conditions in London in the mid 1700s. Do, and this print is sort of a, it's a commentary on how gin was ravaging uh, some of the communities in London at the time, just of uh, alcoholism and gin. And um, I don't know if you guys are seeing all what I'm doing right now, but I was fascinated with this. I was like, how could a place be so destitute and people be so, uh, desperate and there's a baby toppling over a, a railing and um, it wasn't until years later that I realized that this there was a companion piece called Beer Street which is kind of the same scene but it's showing much more harmony people are creative they're painting signs they're toasting each other they are happy and um and now I think I got rid of my dog. <laughs> I'm really sorry about this. Um, do you guys see full screen or not full screen? I don't think we're in full screen. Okay, so now, one second. Now we're in full screen. screen. Okay, great. Okay, so I just went forward. I do, I do that. So, um, so many issues right now. Okay, so I didn't realize there was a companion print called Beer Street, which was contrasting the effects of gin and the effects of beer. And that beer was something that people drank throughout the day uh, in English culture at the time. Um, and casting further back to the 1600s and the 1500s, people drank what's called small beer, which had less alcohol content than we might associate with the beer now. And it was seen as a much safer drink than water, which at that time microorganisms were not very well understood why people would get sick, it, that it was due to drinking water that had been polluted. I and mean, there was some understanding of keeping sewage apart from water, but the practice wasn't there. And so drinking fermented drinks was um, a pretty common cultural practice, uh, cider and beer primarily, um, that was something that didn't make you sick and was seen as nutritious. So when you had uh, immigrants coming over from Europe and especially England to New England in the 1600s and the 1700s, they brought that practice with them. And um, I should backtrack for a second and say that uh, what was interesting about reporting this book and writing it was that I started to understand history in a new way. So uh, there's, uh, it's a hidden history in some ways that how, how pervasive drinking alcohol was among those who lived in the colonies um, before and just after the Revolutionary War. People drank a lot more than they do today. Um, there's been varying uh, numbers on how much they, did, they drank. And um, I use one in the book, but essentially by 1790, which was just past the Revolutionary War, uh, Americans over the age of 15 were drinking 35 gallons of beer and cider a year, five gallons of distilled spirits, such as rum, and one gallon of wine per capita, which is a huge amount of alcohol. Um, and that just kept growing into the early 1800s and sort of resulted in the temperance movement. But to cast all the way back to why that, uh, why that was so fused with culture and life in the colonies, it's, uh, it's necessary to understand how that practice came over from Europe. So 
Beer arrived in the colonies very early. Uh, the first beer is documented in the Virginia colony in 1607, which is uh, very early. And um, even a few years after that, there's documentation of them um, polluting their water sources just as they had from the places that they had uh, come from. But beer also was on the Mayflower. Uh, beer was one of the uh, sus was sustenance on the Mayflower. There was lots of it when the Mayflower left England. The Mayflower got uh, delayed by, I think something happened to delay the ship in the UK. It wasn't the UK then, Britain. Um, there was bad weather and by the time that it reached Plymouth, it, May Mayflower was supposed to go further south, but when it reached uh, Cape Cod around 16, I think November of 1620, um, the beer had been worn, had been, the beer stores had really been worn down by the delays. And there was tension on board between the passengers and the captain and his crew. The captain and the crew wanted to keep whatever beer was left to get them back to England, where um, cult, the, those who became the colonists, the pilgrims, wanted some of that beer for themselves. So there was tension. But fortunately, um, when they did go on shore, they found there's a, if you look in William Bradford's diary, they found water, he's waxing poetic about the water that was found on land in Massachusetts. It was so clear and unlike anything that anyone had drunk before, it tasted delicious. And so uh, they were drinking water. They couldn't drink water instead of beer and it wouldn't make them sick. And within, I think that first summer after that first horrible winter when fair amount of people got sick and died, um, that first summer when they were planting crops, they planted barley and now beer is made, I don't know if any of you brew beer, uh, but it's made from a malt. You need a malted grain, of course, water and yeast to, and, and usually bittering agent, which is hops to make beer. So um, often that malt comes from barley. So barley was planted, it was one of the first crops that were planted um, in the colonies. And the, the colonial climate or the New England climate wasn't that conducive to growing barley. It was, um, you know, there's much more mildew here. It, it was just the heat, the climate is much more extreme. So it didn't quite take. And colonists, as more people arrived and wanted to make beer, brew beer because it was part of their daily life, they would start drawing on a very, a wide variety of sugars to malt for beer from pumpkin to persimmon to you know, all kinds of fruits. Um, maple and in, turn, and in lieu of hops, which weren't growing here either, but they did come over pretty early. They would use um, spruce and pine and other bittering agents so that colonial beer got this beer had, could be, have a wide variety of flavor profiles from my understanding and um, taste, uh, not all that terrific to Europeans who came over to, to visit. This brewing beer does take some skill as well. You need to malt the grain, which takes certain um, equipment and skill and brewing takes certain equipment. So those parts weren't all in place right off the bat. And, and, and sporadically throughout um, the earliest years of the colonies, it was kind of a touch and go kind of thing, brewing beer. But um, very quickly, <laughs> beer was infusing colonial culture. Her Harvard had an on-site brewery uh, in its earliest days, students drank beer with their breakfasts, and um, it was part of part of academic life there. Um, and John Adams, I think his grandfather Joseph Adams was a was a maltster. Um, so uh, it reached into every reached into town and you know, village life would be an apt term. But um, what people also found here, what Europeans also found here when they came over, were grapes growing everywhere, winding along tree trunks and along beaches and just grapevines everywhere. And this excited the English in particular and those who ran the Virginia company because they thought they suddenly had the opportunity to create a wine industry to rival that of France and that the, the colonies would be this place where they could build wealth from, uh, from wine, from making wine. And Unfortunately, the grapes that they saw growing were fortunately well, neutral on, this, on it. The grapes that were growing were not the variety that makes the wine that we're used to drinking, which is Vitis vinifera. The, the variety growing here most of it was Vitis lambrusca. So these small sort of sour grapes that really didn't make great wine. Um, when Vitis vinifera was planted here, people found that again, like barley, it just didn't 
it was attacked by pests. It had mildew, but the Virginia, the Virginia colony had grapes planted very early on. Uh, there was grapes planted on Governor's Island in Boston Harbor from like 1630 on, very, very early after the arrival of the earliest colonists in New England. So um, that was a, an effort that was sort of doomed to failure for many hundreds of years afterward because those grapes just didn't grow well there. But colonists would take to making uh, fruit wines and dandelion wines and things of that nature. But grape wines probably wouldn't, wouldn't really take off in earnest until the mid 1850s, even after the Revolutionary War when Thomas Jefferson was trying to make wine on his estate in George Washington. But, you know, it just wasn't really happening in the way that um, cider happened. And I'm going to go forward and then backward. Um, cider apples, on the other hand, loved New England soil, grew really and grow very well here and were prolific uh, to get a dependable app, uh, apple tree from one apple tree to another. You have to graft. Um, I don't think that that was so well understood. So when you had seeds thrown all over the place, all kinds of different you know, apple trees can be so unique and they're just grown from seed. And then you had this, just, just this wide variety of kind of these small tart apples that made really good cider. Cider takes a lot less equipment than, uh, a lot, lot less skill, less equipment than brewing beer. And consequently it became a very common, you know, it was also a custom brought over from Britain it became a very common drink of um, all sectors of society and all ages as well. And even uh, children would just, communities would put up hundreds, not thousands of gallons of cider. It was a way to preserve the harvest of apples. Um, you could preserve it for many months by making cider out of apples. New Englanders are famously um, economical with what they have. And, uh, there's a rich doc, rich historical documentation through different towns in New England recording how much cider they would put up for that for that year or produce that year. And it was very common in taverns and I'll get into taverns in a minute, but I'm trying to uh, guide you through the waves of what people drank because I've always seen it from doing this research as beer followed by cider kind of with some wine mixed in, but wine was always quite expensive if it was imported. So that was mostly something that those of means would drink. Um, then we have Madeira, which uh, is le much less common now than it was back then. Madeira was the darling drink, especially of um, those who, like the founding, as we know them, the founding fathers um, and people who came from Europe and from Britain, especially. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Madeira, have drunk it. It's sort of this rich, nutty, uh, fortified wine. Um, but the, the origin story of Madeira, whether it's true or not, it seems like it's probably somewhat accurate, is that um, these, these were wines made on the island of Madeira, which uh, somewhat, somewhat a few hundred miles off the coast of Morocco, and but the Portuguese had conquered it in the 1600s and set this fire that burned all the trees and then started planting grapes there and making wine. And that one of these barrels of wine that was destined for India, I think like the British colonies in India was forgotten in the hold of a ship. Ship, And by the time it got back to Madeira, someone found it, opened it up, and instead of being ruined by the heat and the movement of the ship, the wine had gained these delicious caramelized flavors. And you know, it was sort of an aha moment that you could age wine in the hold of a ship. And so barrels of wine were being stuck into a ship and sent around the world and aged that way until they gained this character. And uh, Europeans who had enough money to buy Madeira were gaining a taste for it. And Madeira became somewhat of a craze in the colony, in the cities of um, colonial America. So Philadelphia was particularly uh, full of Madeira. There were Madeira parties there, um, New York as well, and Boston. You'd find it more in cities than in rural areas. Um, ben Franklin was a huge fan of Madeira. He uh, wrote this very entertaining passage of finding a, dip, a few dead flies and dropping Madeira onto them and watching them start to move their legs and they came back to life and flew away. So he thought it had this life-sustaining qualities, um, which is pretty funny. But um, I think Madeira was sipped by Jefferson while writing the Declaration of Independence and um, it was swilled by a great number of... Um, and when I talk about people, 
the historical record is applying to mostly your men of European descent, right? Who have some, you know, they were the ones whose customs were reported. And occasionally you'd have um, a widow tending a tavern, but mostly uh, these records are, they're not applying to indentured servants, to women, to enslaved people. It's we're recording what people like Ben Franklin and contemporaries of that set might be drinking at the time. Although when I get into rum, rum sort of crossed all, rum and cider crossed all uh, class barriers and beer to an extent. Um, this is just a close up of molasses, um, which was a byproduct of the sugar trade in the Caribbean. Uh, uh, sugar grew really well in the Caribbean. Uh, Africans were enslaved to come to come over and and tend that trade. And uh, molasses was an industrial byproduct of sugar making that was thrown away for several decades, um, maybe thrown in the ocean and buried, until it was realized that you could distill molasses with some of the wash from sugar making and make alcohol from it. And rum, alcohol made from sugar is not specific to the Caribbean. There, it, this is throughout the world. There are distilled spirits made from sugar in India and South America and whatnot. But rum became a, a drink that was produced in the Caribbean. Specifically, Barbados was seen as having sort of the height of excellent rum due to their their water that they had there, and um, the trade really took off there. And molasses had been shipped to uh, the colonies as a sweetener, but molasses started to be those in New England started to trade fish and lumber and things that those in the Caribbean needed for molasses for their own rum trade. And um, this is a picture of a distillery. Uh, this is in Antigua, um, what one might look like. And in, oh, we'll get into taverns in a second, but distilleries started to crop up in New England through the 1600s into the 1700s. Medford, Mass was and this uh, was an epicenter of rum production. Um, Newport, Rhode Island, New York, the first distillery, rum distillery in New York was 1646, something that was ridiculously early. So I think all of this stuff was part of um, commerce and life so early. Um, and it built tremendous wealth in New England. Um, the selling of rum, the trading of rum, um, the trading of rum, especially for back to Africa for people. Um, so rum ha has its um, very sinister side to it in terms of global trade, um, global slave trade. Um, some of that rum was uh, from Newport where rum would be triple distilled to a great strength. You could use it as currency to pay for things and rum kept over long periods of time so, uh, and long passages and whatnot. Um, I'm going, uh, these are all gonna be used for building blocks for drinks that I'll get into in just a moment. Um, I don't get my clock up. It's seven twenty-five, so I'm doing okay. But I, I don't see any questions. <laughs> really, send them to me if you if you have them, or we can talk at the end. Um, so the first public house in documented public house in the colony. The, all of these things that you you see the the rum, the beer, the cider. Some was drunk at home, primarily beer and cider, uh, but a lot was imbibed in the confines of the tavern and tavern life um, became very integral to colonial life fairly early on. Again, you're only talking 13 years from Plymouth to the first public house opening in Boston, which is very, it's a blip in time. And um, taverns began to spring up all over Boston and New York, uh, public houses. And the, some of the earliest ones were called ordinaries. I've never quite gotten to the bottom of why they were. But called ordinaries, there's some theories that it goes to the French word ordinaire. But um, ordinaries, public houses, taverns, they come. They would be built at ferry landings initially uh, in cities. Then, as smaller settlements started to crop up throughout New England, they were mandated as part of a settlement. Connecticut mandated them for any new settlement. Massachusetts mandated that new settlements had a tavern, a tavern generally, and a place to worship living in this kind of tent or existing in this tense um this tension between the two right that represent two different parts of cultural and religious life of new england um so they were rife throughout the colonies and uh here's a tavern this one was built a bit later i believe this was built in the 17 
1770s. This is one is in Andover, Mass. And I have it in this presentation to show, uh, you know, well, this typical colonial era home, but uh, one side of the house on the ground floor would be the tap room. If you go to historic taverns, if you visited some, you've probably seen this uh, phenomena. One side of the ground floor would be the tap room, usually with a heart and uh, kind of a closet in the corner where you get your thing. And then the other side might be a room where women could go um, or someone's servants would go well. Uh, the men would go into the tap. They, they were the only ones allowed in the tavern um, portion or the drinking portion of the home. And here's the inside of the tavern from that's in Deerfield. Uh, it's wonderful to visit. It was actually moved from another location to Deerfield. But it shows you that 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 closet in the corner with those bars above it that would come down and go up based on the opening times um, of when drinks were served, which could be were tightly regulated. Every aspect of taverns was tightly regulated from who could run them. Often they'd choose an quote unquote upstanding member of the community to run the tavern. From when drinks could be served, it could be as short as a half hour a day or sometimes longer, um, to how recording how much alcohol you had on hand. Uh, keeping a pretty tight ledger. And, um, and of course, who could go into the tap room? If you see on the, in this picture, there's a bench on the right. There's some chairs on the left. Right behind the chairs, sort of to the side, is a huge fireplace. Um, sometimes in those fireplaces, there'd be a hole in the wall where people could, put, where men could put the pipes that they were smoking. They would discard them in the wall. But bench, benches were some of the earliest seating inside taverns. Maybe I'm nerding out right now about seating, but it is interesting to me how seating evolved in taverns from benches that which fostered the sort of sense of community to, to chairs. Um, these chairs would have come much later um, or you'd stand or, or be standing. Um, here's another tavern inside uh, the reconstructed. Well, I don't know if it's reconstructed. I forget if it is uh, reconstructed. Yeah, I mean, obviously the interior would be, but I can't remember if this building was originally a tavern, but this is uh, Pitt Tavern, Strawberry Bank Museum, another wonderful place in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So it's just sort of the scale of a fireplace inside a tavern. Now, taverns were centers, not just places to drink. They were community centers. They were places you could read newspapers, exchange new, uh, word of mouth news with your neighbors, uh, hammer out disputes um, with other community members. Uh, later on, they became a place for legislation to go down uh, after the revolutionary after the War of Independence, there's this um, great document that uh, in the Vermont Historical Society that shows how much the Vermont legislatures, uh, legislators of like 1787, I think, drank as they traveled around the state, sort of meeting out laws and fixing disputes. And they did that inside taverns <laughs> and they recorded what they drank. So um, there were also games played inside taverns. Uh, here's, this is also the Strawberry Bank Museum shown sort of a typical table. That would be later era tavern, probably late 1700s shows. The pipes, the kind of mug that you might drink out of, the candle, you could write letters there, you could write documents. They, there was a lot going on inside a tavern. So they weren't just sort of all these establishments of drunkenness and partying. Um, and not all taverns had food, but if there was a, a good cook in the home, they would have food, a lot of game, closer to the coast, a lot of seafood and uh, salted pork and Johnny cakes. And that's a whole other subject. I'm very fascinated by the food of uh, colonial America and I've written some more on that as well. But um, here's some tavern signs of the time. They're an, uh, just a wonderful art form. I, uh, some of these were went around in an exhibit about 15 years ago. I, was, I, I saw the exhibit in Hanover, New Hampshire at the museum there, but um, just have that in there for a visual. Now, whoa, that's really in your face. <laughs> some of these drinks photos are even really in your face. I didn't scale them down in time, but um, all of those building blocks I just mentioned, uh, beer or cider. Um, um, I didn't mention mead, but mead was also something that people drank. Uh, it's definitely more expensive because honey, uh, then as now uh, was deer and not as, you know, you need a lot of it to make, to make alcohol, to produce alcohol. Um, all of those were building blocks of a very rudimentary set of cocktails. Even though the word cocktail was not around until 1803 or so, but mixed drinks were a, were a very American phenomenon. 
They were made from a very uh, kind of rough set of ingredients. The alcohols I just mentioned, plus um, maybe maple syrup. If you had citrus, perhaps citrus. Nutmeg was very common as a topping for mixed drinks um, and a few other spices. Uh, they, these drinks had very entertaining names. This one in front of you that's very close up is a rattle skull, which was essentially a dark beer porter mixed with rum and lime and spices. Uh, it's really delicious. It's pretty easy to make. These drinks were not comp complicated and yet they somehow are, a lot of them are very refreshing and very good. Um, you could easily make them at home. Um, this one, <laughs> another close up. I do tend to do this with food and drink photos. Uh, is this is a syllabub. Um, syllabub and posset are usually like punches, they're batch, they're made in large batches uh, of either ale and beer with eggs and cream or wine. That's this one in front of you is wine with eggs, like those are egg whites that are frothed up and cream, and there's nutmeg shaved on top. Um, a celebratory drink that you might have at the building of a barn or a wedding or something along those lines and it be, might be served in a bowl and then have spooned out into, into cups. Um, syllabub over time has also become a dessert. I yeah, It's an American dessert, but early on it was a, a drink that really came over from England and was ad adapted by um, those living in the colonies. Um, this is a stone fence. There wouldn't have really been an artful lemon twist back in the day, that's my touch. But um, this is a blend of, it's a mix of rum and hard cider, that's it. And it's so, it's delicious. I mean, it depends on what kind of cider you're using and what kind of rum, but you basically just put rum in a, in a glass and top it up with hard cider. And um, this was a favorite drink of Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys in Vermont, um, who uh, it said, we're drinking them the night before they went to sack Fort Ticonderoga or across the New York border um, and loved stone fences. And um, they, they hung out at the Catamount Tavern in Bennington, but the night before that particular event at the start of the Revolutionary War, they were at another tavern in Castleton, Vermont that had stone fences. So um, definitely, uh, that, you know, definitely a favorite of that crew of uh, militiamen. And um, now we come to a picture of, it looks a little bit like syllabub, but this is pot, this is a flip. So this would be sort of the, I'm trying to think of an expensive drink now. Yeah. Martini, I, I don't know, all drinks I guess cost kind of the same level of expense, but kind of the martini of its day or the mixed, the, really the quintessential mixed drink of its day. Um, flip is uh, basically with a few variations, Beer or ale, rum, uh, eggs, cream, and spices. So somewhat like a syllabub, but there's a lot more beer and um, it's less creamy. But you mix those ingredients together. Oh, and a sweetener, uh, either sugar, molasses, or maple syrup. It's really good with maple syrup. Um, you put those drinks together, uh, you put those ingredients together and how this might be made back in the day. And I've done this at home as well is you put sort of beer, your beer and rum in one pitcher, your eggs uh, and cream in another pitcher with the sweetener, and then you pour them back and forth between the two pitchers until it's blended. It happens really quickly. Now this gets, this drink gets its name from how it was, it's served warm. So it heated up with a hot poker from the fire called a flip dog. So you could take a hot poker from the fire and plunge it into what you've just blended it sizzles and pops and this charred smoke comes off of it. it the drink gains this charred flavor. It's kind of like a precursor to eggnog. And it would, could be, it would be made differently in every tavern. And sometimes it would cost more than, I've seen ledgers from back in the day where a, a glass of flip costs more than a bed for the night. And sometimes the beds for the night in terms ta in, inside taverns were not especially you know, enticing. They were filled with straw or they had, Pest, pest problems and, you know, probably sleeping would be kind of rough if you were heading outside of the cities along the roads that headed into interior New England, but a flip because of its ingredients and the skill in making it would be fairly expensive to purchase. 
Um, they are really fun to make. You can make them by heating the beer and rum on your stove. If you don't have a fireplace with a cook dog, um, you just have to be careful not to sort of cook the eggs a little bit. There's a trick to it. I talk about it in the book somewhat. Um, Paul Revere, this is a, a depiction, a full depiction of Paul Revere riding into, um, you know, right before the Battle of Lexington, riding into Lexington, April 1775. I think he arrived in town at midnight to let um, let his uh, compatriots know that there were uh, British troops coming up from Boston, and they were, that's when the battle ensued. Now, a lot of those who engaged in the Battle of Lexington were at about 10 o'clock the night before drinking in this tavern, which is Buckman Tavern. And um, it is a historic site you can visit. You can't take photos inside, which is frustrating. But um, I think there's still sort of a cannon dent in the front, in the front door. And this tavern was one of many uh, taverns in town. <laughs> there was like uh, kind of a high quotient of taverns per capita for the population. But the proprietor, John Buckman, was known for flip. And um, those uh, who were in there that night, I think it was April 18th, 1775, were drinking flip, reportedly. Um, and I think they went home at some point and then Paul Revere rode through and people came back to the tavern and were waiting around. And um, by the time the battle happened at like five in the morning, which this is a depiction of that battle, this is like some, some kind of a messy battle. <laughs> it could be because um, there was drinking going on in the hours beforehand. Um, drinking alcohol played a role in many battles of the Revolutionary War because uh, troops drank before they went into battle if they had it. George Washington would drink cider or Madeira. Um, different generals drank different drinks before they before they fought. It also played a role in the lead up to to war because the molasses trade was interrupted by the British who tried to tax it through the Molasses Act in 1633, and I think again with another act like several decades later, and this caused a lot of resentment, along with a lot of the taxation that was causing resentment among colonists, but molasses, the, the taxing of the molasses trade was a particular thorn in the side of um, colonists. And uh, John Hancock, he had a, one of the stores, one of his ship, or the, what was in one of his ships uh, was seized. The, he had a ship called the Liberty, and he had Madeira on that ship, he'd bring Madeira and probably smuggling um, some into the colonies to try to evade taxation. And when his, um, what was on his ship was seized, it was, the, it was the Liberty Affair and caused even further resentment. Um, you had the taverns where people could read, share news with each other, of, you know, how frustrated they were um, and organized for the war. So taverns and alcohol played a key role leading up to and during the war. This is, um, a painting, and I forget the name of it, but you see on the on the table there's a there's a bowl, and that's punch. This is uh, sort of the quintessential punch drinker of the time. Um, punch was another alcoholic drink, uh, commonly uh, imbibed at the time. By punch, I think that the word panch, uh, the, the the root of the word is panch, and I think from Sanskrit, I think meaning five ingredients. So. Um, fruit, uh, rum, or some kind of alcohol. You might have Madeira, let's say fruit, rum, spices, sometimes milk, um, or some other viscous liquid. And now I'm forgetting what the fifth one is. But um, this would be made in a large bowl. And the earliest drinking of punch was sort of by passing around the bowl and everyone would take a sip from it. Um, it's sort of a bonding activity, but also there were, you know, you could spoon this punch out into uh, glasses and of course there's a pipe lying on the table smoke pipe and drink punch and uh, the camaraderie would ensue and drunkenness as well. We should make a comment on uh, drunkenness and tipsiness though. That was another thing that was regulated there. People would be cast out of certain communities for being kind of perpetually drunk or doing things uh, ridiculous when they were drunk. Um, even though alcohol was such a common um, part of life um, from morning until evening and people, John Adams woke up, drank cider before his day got started. Uh, children were drinking cider tin, which was a lower alcohol form of cider. Uh, people would take bitters upon getting up in the morning, which were herbs steeped in alcohol. Uh, they, it was part of the table at breakfast, uh, at midday, at supper. Um, 
using it in a way that was more um, integrated into a productive daily life was socially accepted, being drunk, um, which happened more and more as rum became more widespread, and grog shops, and if you've heard the term grog shops, are these places of ill repute, kind of a step below a tavern where people might go and just drink rum mixed with water, um, where, you know, they, the Cotton Mather would rail against grog and rum and um, so there was this division between what was seen as respectable drinking, which might be wine, beer, maybe some punch, and what was seen as un un unacceptable drinking. And um, the raising of toast was very common at the time, too, which was uh, anytime someone stood up to toast, uh, you know, someone in the room or, um, you know, tongue in cheek, the king, uh, everyone else would have to drink and then that would cause problems because people would get very drunk, they couldn't not stand up for this toast. This is a picture, I'm going to race through the, the last few slides here because I wanted to take some questions. Um, this is a picture of hanging in Vermont from the 1600s, um, just as a way of introducing a drink called Switchel, which uh, kind of specific to Vermont, and it could be alcoholic or not alcoholic, but basically uh, when people couldn't get citrus, they might use vinegar, uh, fermented fruit to give a punch to I'm not using punch in the term of punch, to give a, a kick to drinks. And switchel is a blend of vinegar and fruit and sweetener like maple syrup or molasses. And um, you'll find switchel recipes handed down through generations of Vermonters. Um, this was a, a sort of a new brand that launched maybe 10 years ago um, or eight years ago. Switchel was very delicious, non-alcoholic. Um, you can add alcohol to it, but it wasn't necessary. And, uh, I have the picture of hanging in here because it was a, a summer drink. It uh, replenished electrolytes and was very refreshing and uh, seen as extremely healthy. Oops. Um, after the Revolutionary War, drinking sort of continued on this sort of like feverish path, uh, which eventually led to temperance, the temperance movement and prohibition 100 years later and the disappearance of cider culture, for instance. Um, George Washington uh, began to, or he didn't himself distill whiskey after the uh, war, but he had a whiskey distillery. And um, he was known for making, he, had a, he has a recipe for small beer that still exists to this day. So beer would have different strengths and small beer was the least strong of the beers that were made. This is a, a depiction of him riding off to quell the whiskey rebellion, which was the first crisis of his presidency. And um, what happened during the war was there were uh, an interruption of molasses and rum, the molasses and rum trade. So that was sort of whiskey's ascendancy. Uh, grain, you could make it from grain that was grown here or grown you know, in the Midwestern Pennsylvania, especially. Um, whiskey was, became an American. The, the whiskey uh, industry really got, had its rise at that time and became a much more sort of quintessentially American drink than rum. Rum kind of like dropped off a bit. Whiskey took its place. Um, cider was still around, people still drank a lot. Wine would have another 50 years before it became more common. That happened in Ohio of all places. Um, and Benjamin Rush was uh, the doc, I should say doctor. Benjamin Rush was the sort of main vocal, one of the earliest vocal opponents of drinking. Um, and if you see here on the left, I don't know if you see the tops as a moral and physical thermometer. Um, this is worth Googling. It's a really cool sort of early infographic of alcohol showing um, sort of the, yeah, the moral character of various drinks at the top. On the left, you see water. Then milk and water is right below it. Small beer is below that. It, it progresses through cider, wine, it progressively stronger drinks, porter, which was a strong beer, to strong beer, which had a high alcohol content. Then it jumps forward to punch, toddy, which was um, another rum-based drink. Um, I don't know what crank was. <laughs> it's not, it wasn't the drug. It was um, something different back in the day. Grog and brandy. I didn't talk about brandy, but that was also present. Flip was pretty high up there. Um, shrub was a drink made of um, vinegar, fruit, and, um, and alcohol. And I think at the top of that, you have gin, brandy, rum, and whiskey in the morning. <laughs> that's sort of like, well, that's actually going down the thermometer. It's like it has the lowest moral character. Um, and then to the ne next to that, it shows sort of what happens to you if you drink in that zone and you lie and you have few obscenities and you um, might have black eyes and hunger and end up in the hospital. So um, I stopped this book at the end of the war just 
it just focuses on the colonies because they're no longer colonies at that point. So um, that's where I stopped. I didn't really get too much into the whiskey trade. But the book does have some of the original recipes for some of these basic drinks. Um, this is just a tavern scene from I think the early 1700s. And you see a woman in the corner there. If a tavern keeper chosen by the, by the community passed away, his, uh, often his widow would take his place. And so you do find this culture of uh, female widowed tavern keepers um, from the time, which I found very interesting. Yeah, uh, interesting too, because back in, in the UK or in, in England, I should say, um, women were often charged with making the beer in the home, so, or for the community. And um, there is that integration of um, women and alcohol in these sort of peripheral ways. Um, this is a picture of the book. And um, you see my, my handle there, Late Supper. I'm on Instagram if you'd like to follow me. There's not any colonial stuff there now, but um, and, and my email is there too, if you'd like to reach out. I have a pamphlet, since we're not in person, I can't give it out, but I have a few drinks on a pamphlet that in lieu of having the book, which you can find in all the typical places, or you can email me and I can sign one and send it to you um, if you want to purchase it directly. But um, I do have a pamphlet, like a one-page pamphlet with a few recipes on it. If you like it, you can, if you'd like to have that, just email me and I'll email the PDF to you and you can print it out. So that is that. And um, I would love to answer any questions that you have. Can you see me again? Yes, we can okay, see great. you. And um, I have said it so people can unmute themselves if you have a question for Corinne, or you can put them in the chat still. Um, I'm going to get started with, a, I have a, a bunch of questions and I'll, <laughs> I'll just keep going until other Hopefully people I can questions. answer them. Um, I'm curious about the um, sort of economics of the, of, of the alcohol that pe you know people had through in, in the colonies, were there certain drinks that people drink if they were really wealthy versus you know um, you know less wealthy or even poor? Yeah, certainly. Um, it seems from uh, during this research, uh, wine, Madeira, uh, wine because because wine never took off there because people couldn't make it in the way that they thought they would. They realized that there was not going to be a wine trade here because grapes, the grapes they needed didn't do well. Most of it was imported. So uh, you would find that wine would be something drunk by those of means. Uh, Madeira as well, because it was imported as well. Things that you couldn't make like in your home or couldn't be made in your community were those things that people had more wealth would drink. And you might find them in taverns like Madeira, taverns in cities such as Philadelphia and Boston. Um, I don't have the ledgers in front of me, but you know, they, I think looking at the prices, they were definitely higher prices than say a glass of cider because apples were so widespread and cider making was so widespread. And that's something that people would drink at home and those who had less money and less means could just make themselves. Beer kind of fell between the two. Um, and rum, because it was so plentiful and because there were so many distilleries, uh, in New England, um, with nearly 150 distilleries by like the 1730s, it was so plentiful um, and not always great quality. New England rum was not necessarily for its quality the way the Caribbean rum was. Um, that was something that was watered down in endless, uh, in endless, what not endless, but a very a myriad of ways, grog and slang, and you have all these watered down rum drinks that would be would be something you could drink and would be you know, a tenth of the price maybe of a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. And um, any of these drinks that were developed by the colonists, like I know that beer has been around forever, like for so long and, you know, uh, but I was wondering if there's anything that, that was like, oh, we discovered this. Yeah, I think a lot of them, um, the stone fence for sure, just rum and cider mixed together. It was, uh, I don't know if it was, you know, whoever poured the first one was on New England soil, but it was seen as a New England, it was a New England creation. And um, the rattle, well, the posset and syllabub were, were made in England. That was sort of a, something that originated there. But the rattle skull, um, the flip certainly was uh, something created here. Um, and you know, mixing eggs with alcohol was again, something that had been done in, in Europe, but that the particular way that it was brought together and heated was, uh, Definitely a colonial drink. So, um, and some of these drinks have really entertaining names, like Cram Bamble and um, I mean, Rattle Skulls are entertaining name. I think Bello, Bello, oh, I don't know how to find it, but um, yeah, just really, the, there's sort of a colonial consonant 
names, but yeah, absolutely. Like I see this region as the originator of cocktail culture because these were early cocktails, but that term didn't come about until the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. So these were sort of the precursor to that, like proto cocktails. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about how you said that um, George Washington started distilling. It was it because he had he had enough wealth to like kind of do that as a a side thing, yeah. or was it? I mean, that's like, my, yeah, that's my impression. Yeah, that it was like a gentleman's hobby. He might earn some money from it. I think one of someone who worked for him convinced him to go into distilling. Like he also tried to grow grapes and make wine, which didn't work out. But, um, and he brewed beer uh, pretty consistently before and after the war. So probably part of that was personal interest. Part of that was, you know, I don't know, just have diversifying his farm life um, or his agricultural life. But yeah, I don't know much more about the economic driver or his, you know, the motivation yet. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd come back so you'd have somebody to look at. <laughs> Yeah. And since I'm the one asking a bunch of questions, like I said, everybody, feel free to unmute yourselves or um, ask in the chat if you have any questions. I know I ran through a lot of information pretty quickly, um, and hopefully some of it kind of came through, like the general uh, gist of you know how integral drinking and alcohol was to mm -hmm. colonial culture came through. But yeah, there's a lot of parts to it. So. Well, I was also curious about how you said that in some instances, people would be sort of run out of town if they were misbehaving because of the alcohol. So at what yeah. point did that happen? Because it seemed like alcohol was just such a huge part of everybody's lives. Yeah, I, do, I think that that might be someone traveling into town who then would be told to please leave. And you really couldn't boot someone from living in a town, or maybe if they were a, a repeat offender, but um, the saw sporadic um, references to someone being put in like a stock or you know you know drunkenness being put into like the form of jail um and and some and people visiting i, I assume with people visiting but certain people being asked or men being asked to leave the community because of their behavior but so yeah that that division is blurry the way alcohol is i guess like um there was an intense regulation of how much, what hours you can drink, sort of like there is in, in Britain still. Um, or I guess they've gotten, gotten rid of that most of them. They used to work in a British pub, just as an aside, like they worked in an old medieval pub in Britain, they used to have to yell at people when the time was over for them to drink. So that custom came uh, here, but there were so many rules around drinking and um, in taverns that seemed, um, seemed intended to keep this practice from like, going over um, the boundary where it should go, right? So, um, yeah. But yeah, various punishments and and banishments. Mm -hmm. But I mean, on a case by case basis, you know, was one town more tolerant of um, you know, behavior under the influence of alcohol than another? Probably. This is still a puritanical influence, right? That continues to this day. So, you know. Um, I just guess we get it mixed up. Who's who, who, who was whose dad? I think Increase Mather was Cotton Mather's father. Um, they you know, were famously railing against drinking and drinking spirits, and yet they both drank beer and wine. So um, that's kind of an illustration of what was accepted and what wasn't accepted. Mm -hmm. And I know you said that people could drink from the age of 15 and up, but was it did was it like across the board, wet men, women, yeah. you know, teenagers? I, I used the, the, the age cutoff of 15 just to sort of, because I saw it somewhere when I was doing research, just as a way. I don't think it's, you can necessarily put, you know, I, I've cited 35 gallons of beer and wine. So, you know, and I've seen a number of different figures. It's a ballpark. But uh, when I was doing research, I, I saw that that number had been recorded for those who primarily went to taverns. I don't know if they self-reported or if there was a survey, but that it was, adult males over the age of 15. But then I also saw documentation of children drinking, not just cider can, not low alcohol cider, but small beer. Um, some Europeans would come and visit and say that they saw a colonist giving their kids rum to quiet them or gin. So, and women would drink in the home, as far as I could tell. I mean, their stories are 
definitely less documented than those of other groups. And we don't even know, you know, indentured servants and people who were enslaved, like their drinking practices, you know, it's sporadically, and then indigenous people. So, you know, there's, you know, the, the, inter the intersection of drinking with those different groups seems a little murky, but um, that figure, of 15, I don't think that was a hard and fast, like 15 is the drinking age. It was just what was being recorded. You know, those were the, you know, seen as sort of the members of society, adult males over the age of 15. And I, you know, I know I'm harping on this male, female thing, it's not like I'm trying to alienate, you know, so, you know, express like women didn't get to do it. It's just what it was, right? It's just, that's what it was back then. So mm -hmm. I see some questions. Mm -hmm. um, do you think our current use of the term bar or drinking establishment comes from the bars that were lowered? Possibly, that's a good question. I should know the answer and I don't, but, um, or maybe I did at one point and I forgot, but that seems like a very logical progression. Um, so that's, you know, I wish I knew the absolute answer for you, but it does seem that that could be, that could be true. Uh, and also, you know, a bar is like a place that you can lean, right? So. But was it a place you can leave? Would that have been called a bar back then? Probably not. So that's really smart. Um, I know your book is focused on New England, but through your research, did you find differences between the Southern colonies and the Northern and different alcohol drinks? Now there's de definitely, I, I didn't delve too far into Southern drinking, but I did see, you know, Virginia's on the vert, it's considered the South, right? And so I include Virginia somewhat in this book. And, um, did see drinks that were more common in the South, such as um, cherry bounce, which uh, Martha Washington had a, her recipe for cherry bounce, and she would often give it to her husband when he was going on his um, journeys to and fro. But it was cherry soaked in it and rum um, or brandy, actually. Um, there's a drink called Rata, I'm going to mispronounce it. I'll spell it R A T A F I A, Ratafia. Um, and I think that you would see instances of it here, up here. I should say I'm in New York, New York. I'm outside of New York, I'm in the New York area, but um, I still think of myself as being in New York. But um, I, I touched on this here. Um, yeah, it, it was a European origin. It was like a cordial and you found it more commonly in the South. The types of Madeira, the types of Madeira that people like differed from North to South too. So I believe that the lighter, drier star was more of a northern, northern taste, went for the, the drier Madeira and the southern taste went for like more of a sweeter Madeira. Um, and I think you'll find that with port somewhat now, the regional differences in who likes um, port. And um, so right, to go to back to that Ratafia, I'm just gonna say Ratafia. So it was brandy, it was sort of like cherry bounce, like brandy soaked with like fruit pits or cherry pits or coffee grounds. Um, and so that was more Southern. So yeah, there's there were certainly some differences, um, but I didn't, I am not so schooled in the Southern lexicon, Southern drinking lexicon beyond like bourbon and, and whatnot. Um, but that'd be really cool. That'd be, I'm sure there's people who've delved into it. Um, so I thought there might be another question here, but there isn't. But thank you for both of those. Do you think that um, that alcohol played some economic role in the Revolutionary War? All the different wars that happened, you know, between the colonies and um, uh, the, you know, when when you stopped writing your book. Um, you mean before? Oh, yeah. Well, leading up to the wars, I mentioned the taxation aspect of it was certainly, um, and tea, and of course, tea is part of that as well. Um, but so much wealth was generated through making rum and exporting it to Europe and just selling it to people in New England that that wealth, um, I haven't traced a direct line to whether that wealth, I would assume that that wealth went towards armament and um, just fortifying you know, the colonies for the fight to come against um, colonial rule. But yeah, Massachusetts derived immense amount of wealth. From that. And, and that rum was also brought to Africa and um, traded for humans. So um, in that way, yes, economically, you know, fortunes were certainly built on rum specifically. Mm -hmm. Whereas beer, you know, beer is more of a kind of a 
communities thing, as far as I can tell, not something we, I mean, now we have huge brewing conglomerates, but not, didn't seem like that way back then, but rum distilleries certainly. Mm -hmm. So, well, actually, the, um, just as a last question, maybe, is um, the question of slavery and how that affected um, the making of alcohol or the uh, economics of it. I know you said that it was used to trade for slaves, but it was slave labor used to create the products that make the alcohol that was um, that was uh, consumed at that time. Well, certainly indirectly in um, in the slave trade, fueling the sugar uh, the sugar industry. I mean, without uh, people who were enslaved, like you wouldn't have had anyone to create sugar and molasses and rum. Um, in terms of slavery, and that's, I think that is something I would love to explore more. Like this was written eight years ago and the longer, the more time has gone on and the more aware that we're all, we're all becoming of just like how our history is, is, you know, has a lot more facets to it than we're taught in school. Um, you know, slavery in New England is, of course, different than slavery in the Southern states. And for instance, in New York City, slavery was legal until 1828. And before that time, though, there were, um, they were called free Blacks. Um, that, that's the term that was used at the time. And there was um, people who were not enslaved, who were African-American, had were sort of ran the oyster trade in New York or were very in, involved in the oyster trade. So I'm not as familiar and, and having taverns and whatnot, especially oyster taverns. Um, it's really fascinating. Um, like the first great New York City caterer um, was an African-American man and um, it was like this great catering empire in the mid 1800s. But I'm not, I'm less familiar with if that labor was used in distilleries per se, I would assume that it was. Um, and it's an area of research that you know, I have done more on the food side, not necessarily the alcohol side, but it's a really good question. Um, but certainly um, like sugar, sugar production is what fueled the rum trade and that was all done by, by slaves. Mm -hmm. so. So I'm not seeing any other questions. So um, thank you for this fascinating conversation about, about drinks and the history and, um, and the effects on, on our economy and things like that throughout, throughout our history. It's really, really amazingly interesting. Well, thank you for, thank you. And thank you for having me. I appreciate everyone coming and listening and um, anyone who didn't want to engage here, just please do email me if you have questions or thoughts. I, I love communicating with people on the subject, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I will send out a recap with the uh, video link uh, and your email to everybody who registered. So keep a lookout for that. And so I appreciate everybody coming out tonight for this great program. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you for being here. Thank you.